Take your Bible now and look in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And notice also, he gives you some instruction, which pretty much goes without saying, flee in youthful lust in verse number 22. Uh, in charity and peace, and them that call uh, uh, peace with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strife. So that relieves you from having to deal with uh, individuals who are asking you questions that you don't have to know the answer to. Oftentimes, there's a lot of pressure on people to try to answer things that they can't answer. I'm seeing this happen now with what I would call my contemporary is uh, individuals or preachers who feel like because they're a preacher, they're supposed to know the answers to everything going on. Well, the fact of the matter is that nobody can really tell you exactly what's going on right now. So you can exercise wisdom by saying, I don't know. That doesn't mean that you're stupid. It just means you don't know or don't have the ability to obtain that kind of information. Now, maybe you can do the research and maybe you can come up with an answer, but there are certain things that people don't realize that create a tremendous amount of frustration in your life and ultimately lead to anxiety. And that is you trying to answer a question that can't be answered. So if somebody comes to you and you're like, I wonder why this is occurring, then you might think to yourself, well, why is it occurring? I've got to come up with an answer. Some questions you can't come up with an answer to. Here's a good question for you. Why is God letting this happen? You say, well, I, I know what it is. Really? You know what's happening? Why did God let the Holocaust happen? Why did God let Hitler take over things the way he did? Or Mussolini or Stalin? Why did God let the things go on back during the time of the AIDS epidemic that took place down in Africa, which you may or may not know much about that, when millions of people died because they're down there doing a bunch of shenanigans? Why did the Ebola thing take place? Why is this stuff, this, you can't answer all those questions. You ever wonder this? You ever, one of the greatest questions I get asked when I used to travel a lot was why do g bad things happen to good people? <laughs> Your first response ought to be, well, the Bible said there's none good, there's none righteous, there's none that seeketh after God, so who are you determined is good? And we usually fit that category. But one of the frustrating things is, is for you to try to answer a question that you can't answer. Uh, one of the things that people don't understand is, is that I'm going to show you here in just a minute is, is that very few people will take the time that you say, I should know better. But in order for you to know better, you have to examine yourself in light of truth, in light of what the standard of truth is. Well, the standard of truth for us, ladies and gentlemen, is the Bible. So you can't go to popular opinion or public opinion because you will always gravitate towards something that appeals to your flesh or that protects you or your position from where you are. And then what can happen is you get really, really frustrated because you can't find an answer to your question. There's not always a reason why. Some things happen and you won't know the answer to it until you wind up up in eternity. You can say from now on, you know, oh, why did my dad die at 64? That seemed, that's young, man. That's my age. I mean, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I'm relatively healthy. I mean, I can't imagine. My dad was an athlete. My dad uh, didn't ever do anything wrong or nothing that I know of. Immoral, illegal. I served the Lord and did all the other stuff he did. 64 years of age, gone because of a blood transfusion given to him 10 years before. A fellow asked me one time, he said, Preacher, let me ask you a question about your dad. I heard the illustration you gave that he contracted uh, hepatitis C because of a blood transfusion. Uh, did you uh, sue the hospital? I said, no, my mama didn't want to do anything like that. We were glad to have him for the 12 years after he had the transfusion and then to have not had him at all. We got 12 more years out of him and that kind of a thing. Why did Jim go at 54? Why is the old preacher gone now? You can't, you can't answer that. You can't, tell, you can't say you honestly have an answer to that. Why do kids go prodigal? You can't say. What's going on with the economy? You can't say. So what do you have to learn to do? You have to realize God's in control of the whole thing. Nothing going on right now did not come across his desk. You say, what did he do? Signed off on it. People nowadays are going around wanting to say, you know, well, why? Well, why? Well, let me ask you this. Let's just say you had the answer to that question, that you knew the why. Would it change what's happening? So what good does it do to know why? Now, I'm going to get just a smidgen touch on where psychology finds its roots today because they spend a lot of time finding out why you're doing what you're doing, but it doesn't change what you're doing. 
Knowing the why doesn't address anything. Well, I got dropped on my head when I was a kid or I was abused when I was a kid. I didn't have a good mom or a good dad or I, I didn't have this. and all. all those may be valid reasons that have caused a symptomatic response, which is you act the way you do because of an environment that you were in, but it doesn't change the fact that you're acting whacked out. In order for an individual to be able to have the, ex uh, the examination of themselves, the standard of truth has to be borne out and an individual, unless he's the devil, has to be willing to admit, I could be yes. wrong. Yeah, where most people stop is where it is right here, to the acknowledging of the truth. That truth they're talking about there is acknowledging the truth about themselves. Most people don't want to hear the truth. Now they want to hear the truth about the government. They want to hear the truth about the virus. They want to hear the truth about uh, what happened in the wars and this and that and the other. That's not what your passage is written about. The passage is written to you personally, individually, for you to examine yourself in light of the Bible. Not the preacher examining you, not the pastor, not the pope, not a psychiatrist, a psychologist. You could put psychologists, I'm not saying there's not, valid, there's not validity to what they do. Don't misunderstand me. But a lot of what they do is just simply string along trying to find the why as to why you're acting the way you're acting. I'll tell you why. All of us refuse to acknowledge the truth about ourselves. And therefore, we are taken captive by the devil at his will. He can throw a net over us and drag us back in. Which begs the question, can the devil repent? No, he can't. You know why he can't? It's not because he's prevented from repenting. He will not acknowledge the truth that he's wrong. He won't acknowledge that truth. Brother, will you check and see who that is at the front door? They're trying to get in there and see if you can help them out. Thank you. All right, now notice what he says here. Flee youthful lust and righteousness and all avoid foolish and unlearned questions. The servant of the Lord must not strive, be gentle unto all men, uh, to teach patient and meekness, instructing those. Now notice your greatest opposition. Who is it? It's yourself. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, and high places. Paul says here that the individual that has trouble is you looking in the mirror and admitting you have a problem. You want me to solve your marital problem? Stop looking at her. Stop looking at him. Stop looking at the kids. Stop looking at the boss. Stop looking at the teacher. Stop looking at the police. Stop looking at the doctor. Stop looking at, look at yourself in the mirror. What mirror? The thing you have cracked open in front of you right now. See, the people don't like this because I can't tell you that the problem is something going on in China. The problem is something going on in Russia. The problem is something going on in the out, out White House. Pardon me. Something going on at the governor's mansion. Something going on here. Something going on there. No, the problem is people. The problem is, is the world would be a great place if it wasn't for people. Uh, somebody said the other day, he said, you know, well, you know, if, if guns cause death, then forks cause obesity, so they ought to get rid of forks. <laughs> the fork doesn't cause obesity. It's the picking up and using it. A lot of people have taken those forks, you know, that are usually four in there, unless it's a special fork, and they take that thing and they make it look like a duck's foot and they put it together this way and make it look more like a shovel and then they can shovel more in at one time. It's not the instrument. It's the person holding the instrument. It's not the instrument. Now, the danger of this is, is that then oftentimes uh, preachers or some well-meaning Christian will say, well, if the problem's you, now I'm going to legislate to you what your problem is, and I'm going to tell you like a doctor prescribes medicine after he does a diagnostic or diagnosis on you, he's going to prescribe medicine for you, then they pick up the Bible and they write prescriptions for individuals. Well, I hate to tell you this, the prescription is for them first. Nowadays, you see this resurgent of a theology that's saying, uh, I believe in, in uh, eternal security if you're truly, really, honestly, for sure, positively saved. Well, who makes that determination? Well, uh, I, I do. I'm the pastor, and I determine that by the role and see whether or not you're attending. I determine that by giving. I determine that by whether or not you're witnessing or dressing right and all that other kind of stuff. That's not biblical at all. People say right now, and I'm glad we're together. Don't misunderstand me. But people say this idea that you're afraid, you're scared, you're big sissies is one of the things that somebody affectionately wrote to me. What a big sissy to be a, where you're from. You're afraid of catching a virus. I'm afraid of catching a virus. I have people to look out for. 
You know what it is? You're, you're, a, you're a big sissy. Why? Because you think you're being bold because you're standing up for your right to gather? Well, what about the people in the catacombs? Amen. What about your brothers and sisters in China right now? What about people in Saudi Arabia right now? Why don't you go call them big sissies? What about people that are having to meet underground and all those kind of things just for the benefit of being able to have a church service? What about the people back years ago when Jim and I went to Romania or they're tying pages of a Bible on the back of a Bible, on um, back of a doll with a belt and putting them in a sandwich bag and running them across the river over there so they could get a page of the Bible to sit down sitting there in Romania in a dark room with all the windows knocked out and one single 60-watt light bulb hanging down in the center of that thing and a bunch of people sitting around there passing around a page of the Bible. You, you call them cowards? Big sissies? Because they're afraid of being persecuted? You're a fool to say something like that. You, I'm not going to accuse people of doing that. I had a young man call me and you know him. He's got some major problems. He said, Preacher, I really want to come tomorrow. And I said, well, brother, you okay, if that's what you want to do. He said, well, I'm calling you. What do you think? And I said, brother, with the conditions that you have, why would you take that chance? I said, why don't you wait till things settle down? Well, you know, I've been watching this and I've been watching that. And, you know, maybe there is something to it. Maybe there isn't something to it. Maybe there's this. I said, there's too many maybes. Nobody knows for sure. I don't, I'm not going to judge your spirituality or your boldness to do something like that. Trust me, I'll be leading the charge if they tell us we can't meet, if we can't preach Jesus, if we can't pass out tracts, if we can't do that. That's not what they've told us. You see, ladies and gentlemen, accepting the truth about yourself oftentimes has to do with your positions even politically. Because you'll generally fall into line with somebody that meets your physical needs, not your spiritual needs. Now, God knows about that, and the devil refuses to acknowledge the truth that, in fact, is, the fact is, is that he's wrong. So the devil gets permission to, uh, from God to mess with men. That's found in the book of Job. You know, the Lord said, you consider my servant Job. That's interesting, isn't it? That the Lord brings Job to the devil's attention. Kind of not fair, you know. It's kind of like the Lord saying, you consider my servant Job like the devil's not going to say, well, yeah, no wonder he's a righteous man of skew of the evil. You built a hedge of protection around him. Nobody can judge him. You turn him over to me. I'll tell you what I'll do to him. I'll turn him every which way but loose. And the Lord said, okay, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to. Just don't take his life. And boy, it's hail Columbia. The domino starts right there and it begins to come down. And Job's answer is, naked I came in the world and naked I shall leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job's three miserable comforters, that kind of thing. Good thing it wasn't wintertime. Job's three miserable comforters, they come in. Every one of them try to put them under false conviction. If those individuals had done that, you know what, uh, had done what I'm trying to show you here today, they would have looked at that thing and before they ever opened their mouth to Job, you know what, they would have looked at themselves and said, man, I ain't got no room to be talking. I better keep my mouth shut, man. I mean, good night. I got one point in that way and three point in this way. I better watch it. So the, the passage he's going to show you begins to be personal. Now, isn't it interesting that we're, you have no idea how great this is to see actual people sitting in here. I can see your faces going and you're smiling and all that kind of stuff. I mean, this is like, oh, so much better than the last few weeks. But, but here's the thing. You have to understand or realize one of the telltale signs that there is a problem with you is your incessant interest in other people's issues. If you're always being critical of everybody else, gossiping, slandering about everybody, what everybody else has done, and it is one of those things that you should immediately stop and say to yourself, oh man, maybe there's a problem with me first. Number two, I'll say this, uh, they're taken captive when the devil wants to take them captive. Look at Romans chapter number 11. And why is that? Because of sin. In other words, if you're doing something that you shouldn't do, he put 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible for a reason. And it's not just to restore fellowship, it's to keep you uh, protected. Do you understand? It's to keep you protected. You say, why? Once you put it under the blood, the devil can't use it against you. You say, well, preacher, you know, I'm confessing the same thing over and over and over. Keep confessing it. You say, why? It keeps you protected. Don't, don't lose that protection just because you're so proud to go, well, I'm probably going to do it again. You probably will. 
Now, before you take that and turn it into something, you know, horrible and whatever your mind to make, make up that like uh, Cain figured or like the elder brother figured on the the prodigal son, when he goes out there and said he's wasted his money on these uh, riotous living and on these women and stuff, there's nothing in the passage that says that. That elder brother figured what he would do if he went to the far country. So he mirrored that or transplanted it over to another individual. That's one of those things they do. But, but, but at any rate, don't, don't be making that assumption. The first thing you want to do is take a look and go, hmm, I messed up again. The Lord said, okay, confess it. Well, but Lord, I hate to keep confessing the same thing over and over. Yeah, I hate to see you keep confessing it. But there's more than just restoring fellowship. It allows me to protect you from the devil. He can't throw the net on you if it is something that is confessed. Do you understand? So, so you, you got to understand, don't matter how many times you use it, you're never going to get complete victory, excuse me, over everything until you are dead or the rapture. So in the meantime, accept the fact that you're going to fail. You're going to have faults. You're going to have trouble. You're going to say whatever it may be. Do whatever it may be. And when you do, don't hesitate. Don't wait around. Don't pause and say, well, I need to feel guilty a while. And I don't want to be too good. No, uh -uh. I mean, tell them right now, right now. Lord, forgive me. I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll take my whooping. But in the meantime, Lord, I, I, want, to, I want to ask you to forgive me. Get the protection. You say, why? Otherwise, the devil come along with his net, fling it out over you and drag you off into the bushes again. Are you in Romans chapter number 11? Look, if you will, please, in verse number 9. David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say, have they stumbled that they should not, that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. The apostle Paul's making an illustration. You say, what happened? The Jews refused to admit Admit they were wrong. The Jews refused to admit they crucified their Messiah. Do you know why? He's using an illustration. Because when the Messiah came, he didn't fit their figure of how he ought to come. We're looking for him to come in and kick Rome off the throne. This is why Peter said, Lord, not so, Lord. You're not going to go die. You're coming in here as a military ruler. And, you know, me and these other 11 boys here, not knowing who Judas was at the time, we're going to wind up taking over. We're going to be the leaders of this great army. And you're going to be like it was in the days of David's kingdom. And you're going to come in and you're going to roust out Rome. And you're going to put Rome under your feet. And you're going to mash them down. And we've already decided that. What you talking about a cross? What you talk about dying? What you mean you're going to give your back to the smiters and your cheeks to be plucked and to be spat upon and bruised for our iniquities and, and the chastisement of your peace is laid upon you? What do you mean that? Not so, Lord. I'm ready to fight. You know what happened? The nation of Israel as a whole was with Peter. Their attitude was, he doesn't fit our mold. Well, in the day and time in which you live, and I know this is going to be hard for some people to grab a hold of, your time is not now to be riding a white horse and taking over the government. Right. You're seeing a repeat of what you saw at the first advent. You're seeing the nation of Israel saying, we want the chains and the bondage of Rome off our neck. And they missed it. The time for the second coming of Christ, which we're going to talk about. I know it's Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day and Happy Grandmother's Day and Great Grandmother's Day and those kind of things. But I'm preaching to you this morning about what you ought to be looking for. And it's not Chinese people invading your troops. It's not submarines off the coast. And it's not uh, Cossacks coming down with a Roman hat on their head and all that kind of, a furry hat on their head. Here's what happens. Today, guess what's happening? The Bible's being turned into, let's get this oppressive government off our necks. Instead of Jesus said, no, it's time for a towel, not a sword. You're supposed to be ministering to people right now. 
Why? You got people sick. You got people scared. You got people dying. You got people having all kinds of problems. People, listen, even if they didn't get the disease, the results of what they've done and how they've chosen to do it has resulted in an economic uh, downturn, shall we say. <laughs> shall we say that there's going to be some real issues, some real problems, some real difficulties because of what's occurred? I think so. I think it'll, it'll probably make a difference. But so here's the thing. It's the same thing repeated. What do we know? We know history repeats itself. Ecclesiastes says, that thing which shall be <laughs> hath already been. So, so now you have the church age and instead of the church looking at itself and going, okay, let's make sure we don't get involved in things we have no business getting involved in. Let's make sure we keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, let's make sure that we're not trying to use the church as a political vehicle to accomplish Peter's theology. By the time Pete gets right, he's preaching 2 Peter chapter number 2 and he says, hey, while Nero was in charge, you know what he says in 2 Peter chapter 2? He said, pay your taxes so the word of God be not blasphemed. Wait a minute, Peter. Aren't they burning Christians? Wait a minute. Aren't the Christians being put on the rack? Aren't they being fed to lions and bears and tigers? And Pete said, yeah, they are. That's exactly what's happening. But I learned that lesson a long time ago when the Lord said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because I refuse to look at my... Self, you with me? You know what he's saying right here? Because the Jews wouldn't admit that they were wrong because they were trying to put Jesus in a box. Could you just allow me the liberty here for a second? Trying to put Jesus in a box and adjust him to your theology will not work ever. It is akin to what the devil did. The devil said, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I will set my throne above the stars of heaven. I, I, I. Do you see Laodicea in that? Oh, I do. You know what the Lord said? No, you're the fifth cherub that covers. I give you rulership of the earth here and the sons of God and that kind of thing. It ought to be a, ought to be a grill hoot nanny. Satan said, no, I don't like it. I want you to fit into me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you under my theology and I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. Make you be. Listen, you're dealing with the God of the universe. You're not going to make him fit your theology. Now, it's not that you don't matter. He proved that because he loved you and he died for you. Do you understand? But be real careful. It's not a marriage in the sense that that now means you can manipulate your husband. It's not, it's not a modern theology where, you know, the husband and the wife and they're equal and the husband's the head, but the wife's the neck that turns the head stuff. <laughs> Y'all are getting nervous on me now. All the, all the women, all of a sudden, they went from this to... <laughs> That's not biblical. That's not biblical. You just said that because your wife's not here. <laughs> it's not biblical. Ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's the Bible. You might find yourself in a better position if you go by what the truth of the Bible is instead of what you want, how you want God to make it fit. Do you see how it fits in all aspects of life? The next thing you know, you start taking those Bible verses. Here's a good one for you. Jesus drank wine. Right? Yep. Have a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Oh, well, see, there's justification. If I want to drink, I can now take the Bible and instead of looking and going, wait a minute, I'm now trying to make him fit my theology so social sipping becomes okay. You with me? Do you see how dangerous this is? That's how it is that all of a sudden, see, it's not always in these huge Ted Bundy kind of things. It's in those little tiny things. Remember in the Old Testament, he says, the little foxes spoil the vine. He doesn't mention the lions and the tigers and the bears and all the big animals. You know what he said? Those little foxes that come in and creep around and they spoil the vines and mess things up and wind up running your crop. All right, let me give you a, a couple more. He wants you to confess your sins. Look in uh, Psalm 39 for protection. It's important to keep your sins uh, confessed. That has to do with standing in state. Now I'm going to hit this again real quickly. And the reason is, is to properly equip you so that when you hear uh, somebody giving you something contrary to this, that you'll know right off the bat, we're in the book of uh, uh, Psalms, uh, you'll know right off the bat what I'm talking about when I tell you 
that your standing in your state is something important to understand in this sense. My standing is I'm seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. That's called eternal security. Right. That means I'm saved even if I don't act like it. Right. Now, I know you always act like it. But sometimes I don't act like it. Did I lose my standing? No. I'm in fellowship with him uh, in, in eternity. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. Did I lose my state, my fellowship? Yeah, you might say so. <laughs> I chose not to do what he told me to do and to obey is better than to sacrifice. Now, it's important for you to get, especially those of you that are new. Because what's being taught nowadays is, is that there is no such thing as dual personality after you're saved, flesh and spirit, Galatians 5 and Ephesians 4, and that he doesn't deal with that thing. What's being taught today is, is that you can tell that your standing is secure if your state is secure. Now, please don't raise your hands, but anybody in here ever acted like you were not saved? Amen. I mean, according to the Bible, Amen. you know, just a little gossip, a little slander, just a little lie, you know, that kind of thing. Just, I mean, just little small things. Okay. According to their theology, that's proof you weren't, you're not saved and never was saved. Never were saved. Sorry about that. So, uh, but, but you know what? That doesn't prove anything at all. It means that my standing is secure, but my state is not what it ought to be. Here's a great provision for us in the New Testament church. That is, is that my standing is secure. That does not give me the right to sin, but it gives me the security of knowing that when I do, because my salvation is in His hands, not my hands, that means that I know that I'm safe, I know that I'm secure, I know that I'm sealed to the day of redemption, but I need to work on my fellowship. And anybody that says to you that they're in fellowship 100% of the time, I'd be very wary of, because they're not being honest. I do real good when I'm asleep. The second I wake up, I think I'm having a great day. I get up and I do my normal morning routine and I catch a little bit of the book and do some of the things that I need to do and kind of get my day started. And I might be going to do anything from grading papers to whatever. And it isn't long before something trips my trigger and then my mind's in somewhere else and the Lord's like, well, my, my, my. <laughs> what happened to you? <laughs> And I'm, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm human and feeble and frail as dust. And the Lord said, okay, you're right, don't ever forget that, come on back in. Amen. You know what the prodigal's greatest trip was? You say the far country. No. You say back to the father's house. No. No. The greatest trip that prodigal made was, and when he came to himself... That's the hardest trip for anybody to make before they get back to the Father's house. Looking at myself, when he came to himself, he said, you know, the servants at my Father's house have plenty of bread to eat and left over. And man, I've sinned against God and against him and I'm no more worthy to even be called a son. I shouldn't even be going over there. But you know what? I could go over there and maybe he'd give me a, a job as a servant for bread. I could at least eat bread. That'd be good. I'm going over there and tell him I was wrong. And I'm, don't even call me a son. Don't give me the benefits of being a son. Just could I, could I stay in the servants' quarters and just eat bread from the table? Where did he quit being a son? He never did. But that journey to yourself, that's a hard journey. You ever have somebody sit down with you? And maybe you haven't had the benefit of that. I've had a couple of men in my life that were... Uh, a, a bit um, straightforward and tactless when it came to dealing with some questions I asked them about me. And uh, I have to be honest with you, they said some things that hurt because they were true. Sure. Yeah. See, I don't know about you. Most of you say you have a desire for truth. David said, I desire truth, Psalm 51, in the inward parts. Yep. Uh, most of you say you love the truth when it's about Sean sure. or Mitch yeah. or yeah. Dale or TK Amen. or Russell or Brad mm -hmm. or the preacher. Yeah. I, I don't want to leave the ladies out or Tara or Jennifer. <laughs> you understand? But when it comes to you on an individual basis, Jessica, Sharon, 
got quiet. But truth in the inward parts, that's somebody sitting down with you and saying, you're the one with the problem. You know what the natural response is? Justification for why we acted the way we did instead of going, you're right. I was a jerk. Now, why was I a jerk? No. Let's fix the problem. The reason you're a jerk is you're so full of pride you won't admit that you're the one with the problem. Because only by pride cometh what? Okay, let's apply it to you and me. That means when the Bible says one thing and I think another thing or I twist it, that means the Bible can't be proud. The Holy Spirit can't be proud. Jesus isn't proud. God's not proud, right? Well, where's the problem? Do you ever see people sometimes they come to church and they get mad? Do you realize it's not usually because of a political position? It's not because of some social thought or idea? Do you know why many preachers have resorted to now preaching on those things instead of personal fellowship with Jesus Christ? Because it doesn't create a condition of conviction or contention. It put them at odds. But if a preacher preaches the Bible, somewhere it's going to be personal. Brother Jim used to say, he said, if I shoot and hit you in the head, I missed because I was aiming at the third button on your shirt. Because a lot of us get it in our head. Those are intellectual truths. You following me? This is hugely important. Knowing the second advent, knowing the rapture of the church, knowing the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, knowing that we're saved without works, knowing the position of baptism in the believer's life has nothing to do with salvation and the taking up of the, uh, 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 where the offering fits and all the other things that we do. Those are intellectual truths. Those aren't too difficult to grab a hold of. I know some people that are gun barrel straight when it comes to that, and they're mean as a snake. Let me show you something real quick. Let me give you this in Psalm 39 real quick, if I could. Look, if you will, verse number 5. Uh, I'm, I think I'm on to something that will help you here. Behold, thou hast made my days as in hand's breath, and mine age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether what? Amen. Well, who's the every man? I'm just going to say it's every man. Do you know who's writing that? That's one of the guys in David's court. That's a song for David. That comes right after the chapter on some kind of venereal disease or some kind of other disease in Psalm 38 that David had because of his sin. In Psalm chapter number 51, let me show you that real quick. Real quick. Psalm chapter number 51. Watch David get real person, personal real quick. Have mercy upon me. Blot out my transgressions, verse 1. Wash me, mine iniquity. Cleanse me, my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. Verse 3, my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou speakest, uh, my, excuse me, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and sin my mother's conceived me. Behold, thou desirest truth where? Watch verse 7, purge me that I shall be clean. Wash me, make me, verse 8, to hear joy and gladness. heart. My, uh, my bones hath been broken. Hide thy face from my sins. Create in me a clean what? Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Look, if you will, please, in Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Now, this is going to be a difficult thing because the Lord is going to deal with some emotional things here. The, the shallow way of looking at these passages is to think that all God does is just deal with how you look and how you dress and oftentimes how you treat uh, your fellow man and things like that. Well, that's, a, that's sort of a shallow interpretation of things when you're trying to control people because you think if you get them fixed up on the outside that they're right on the inside. Now, would you just allow me the liberty of saying to you that for a little better than all total together 20 years, I had my share of dealings with drunks and with drug addicts. 
And on more than one occasion, when they arrested him and put him in jail or put him in detox or whatever it might be, clothes were tattered and torn and teeth popped out of their head and skin poppers on them and, and breath had blistered the paint off a wall at 100 feet and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, just nasty and filthy. You walk into court because they want a trial and all that kind of a deal instead of pleading guilty. And you look over at the defendant's table from sitting up on the platform. They're always over here on the right-hand side. And you look at the defendant's table and the first question they say is, do you see the person in question in the courtroom? As if you can't recognize the guy that you put in jail. And you look over there and I made the mistake one time. I was a little bit of a smart aleck and I said, uh, well, yeah, that looks like the same guy, but he didn't look like that when I arrested him. And bam, the gavel came down and the judge admonished me and said, we're not hearing your opinion. And you ask a question, answer, and then, your honor, I object. I mean, they went off like a scud missile. And so, because the guy's sitting over there in a suit and tie with a haircut and clean shaven and got foo-foo juice on it and stuff like that. Amy looks like a regular businessman. And I'm thinking, I'll put that same guy in jail half a dozen times for being drunk, laying around, doing stuff he shouldn't be doing, everything you can imagine, stinking reprobate. And he's sitting there in court. Here's modern theology. Modern theology thinks because you get him dressed up on the outside, you've done something on the inside. Some of the meanest two-faced devils I've ever met in my life are people that have a King James Bible and rightly divide it, but they never apply it to them. And that's what I'm trying to warn you about. Somebody that is always focused on what your wife or what your daughter is wearing is probably a pervert. Modest apparel. Well, what is that? I don't know. Talk to your husband. Talk to your daddy. I'll give you some direction. I mean, if I'm in youth camp or whatever else it might be, uh, between me and Brother Sam, we'll tell you if what you're wearing is inappropriate. But that's where we're there. But when it comes to everyday life and what your kids wear at school and what they wear at home and all that kind of stuff, that ain't my business. That's your business. Until it winds up all over the cotton-picking Internet. And then you push it over on my table. Pardon me, lest I digress. <laughs> Here's the thing that's more important than what's going on on the outside. What's more important on the outside is what's going on on the inside. You have a woman over there uh, that's uh, a, a woman of ill repute. I mean, if nothing else, she's definitely an adulteress because of her participation with six different men. And none of them are her own husband. So she's, uh, uh, you know, aiding and abetting them uh, committing adultery. There's not one thing in that passage where the Lord says anything to her about what she should do on the outside. You know how I know something happened to that woman? You say, because she went in town and she took off all the makeup and she took off the jewelry and she fixed her hair back up and, you know, she put on a burqa and, and that kind of a thing. Not a mention of it at all. You ever notice the absence of that in the passage speaks volumes? The Lord leaves things like that out for a reason, to make you think. What do you know? Well, how do you know something happened? You know what she did? She went into town. You know what she said? Come see a man told me everything I ever did. Yes, yep. there's, there's a two-edged sword. Number one, come see a man told me everything I ever did and gave me a gift you can't even possibly imagine. But just so you know, before you go back out there and start trying to tell him things that you know about me, that you want to hold against me, that all, just letting you know, he told me everything. He's already taken that out of your mouth. Now you better deal with it on your own. So you know what I know? I know out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I know I'm close to my time here, but bear with me. Especially those of you that are quarantined or, you know, staying home by yourself. You can listen for another second or two. This is important for you to grab a hold of. Look in Ephesians chapter number 4. He says in verse number 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Where would that corrupt communication come from? It come from the heart. Out of the abundance of the what? The mouth speaketh. As a man thinketh in his so is he. So let no corrupt. So if there's corrupt communication coming out of my mouth or for some of your fingertips, you know what that means? There's something wrong with the heart. Amen. You've got a problem with language and things like that. There's something wrong with the heart. Now watch. But that which is good used to what? Edifying. I got to stop there. In other words, if what you're saying is not helping and, and exhort people, encourage people, edify people, you got a heart problem. Corrupt communication here is not just cursing and foul language and dirty stories. Corrupt communication here, ladies and gentlemen, is, is something that's not edifying people. When you're tearing everybody else down. So you get your position by tearing everybody else down. 
Don't pick that up from other preachers and stuff like that and think that's the example that makes you great because you can knock somebody for their foolishness, tearing people down. Now watch. And grieve not the Holy Spirit that it may minister, excuse me, grace to the hearers. Verse 30. Now watch this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. How can I not grieve Him? Look at the first thing on there. Let what? All what? Bitterness. How about that? You say, what is that? That's an emotion. That's not your way of dress. Have you not ever known some individuals in life that are dressed to the nines and they've got every kind of great, wonderful clothing that could possibly be? They might even attend a large church and that kind of a thing and they might even know. Have you not known people like that that are bitter? Amen. They're dressed nice, yep. nice haircut, everything's trimmed, shoes polished, right? Ladies got on a long dress and long sleeves and are not exposing their bodies and that kind of a thing and bitter. Watch. It's going to be emotional. You're going to find this hard to believe. You say, why? The Lord deals with emotional problems, not just physical problems that everybody else can see. Why? He cares about you. He's talking to Christians. You're sealed to the day of redemption. That's not unsaved people. That's saved people. Saved people that can be bitter, not according to modern preachers. Oh, if you're bitter, you're not saved. Where'd that come from? I'm going to say that's a root of bitterness. You've got a lot of them that are bitter. They're over there like Simon the sorcerer. And Pete looks at him and he says, I, I've looked at you and I've figured out where the problem's coming from. You're trying to buy the Holy Spirit. Why? You're caught up in the gall of bitterness. You're mad because all of a sudden the spotlight's not on you. You're mad because you got called out. You're mad because we took your cash cow away from you. You're in the call of bitterness. That's why you're acting the way you're acting. That's why a lot of guys are doing some of the things they're doing nowadays. They're caught up in bitterness. They didn't get the time and the, and the recognition they thought they should get. Watch. And wrath. You know what wrath is. It's easy to do. But it's, wrath is not an outward action. It starts inwardly. It may result in battery or assault or it may result in something else. But wrath is something that's an emotion. It's getting angry. It's getting mad. It's getting out of control. Watch. And anger. And clamor. That's where you get the word claymore from. That's loud, hollering, screaming, making your point at the top of your lungs. Screaming. You say, what are you doing? You're progressing. Your bitterness has turned to wrath. It's turned to anger and then clamor. And then guess what happens? Evil speaking. I don't know. We might want to go up and let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. The evil speaking comes because you've let those emotions override you. And then guess what happens? The evil speaking starts coming out. And now it's name calling. And now it's belittling people. And now it's putting people down and hurting people and you getting a reputation for your expense like you do in a marital fight sometimes. And then look at the last thing. Be put away with what? All what? You know what malice is? You know where it ultimately winds up? Malice is intentionally hurting somebody. I call that Theodore Ted Bundy religion. You're, you're intentionally, you get great pleasure out of hurting somebody. You just, you just can't wait. You got some truth you can get on somebody. You can't wait to let people know it. That's malice. You're intentionally harming somebody. You know what he said? You're grieving the Holy Spirit. Now here's, here's what it boils down to. And I'll we'll take a quick break here and then we'll get regular for the service. Here's what it boils down to. It boils down to the first portion of the scripture. And he says on top of not letting the evil communication proceed out of your mouth, that which is good to the edifying, right? Here he comes. You ready? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. See the emotions getting in there? And clamor and evil speaking put away with all malice. Here's the hard part of that. And here's the balance. Do I care more about having my way or not grieving the Holy Spirit? Because it is without exception that when you allow those emotions to overrule even your verbiage, your, your words, what you basically said is, I don't care if I grieve the Holy Spirit or not, I'm going to have my way. I ask you a question. Is that more like Jesus 
or the devil. Let me show you the comparison. Nevertheless, not my will, but you know what the devil said? I will. I'm not calling you the devil. I'm just making personality comparisons. <laughs> that if you want to do your own psychological exam with the exception of the evil speaking, which is symptomatic of a root problem, right? So, so look, I, I, you have a bunch of medical experts in here, so y'all correct me if I'm wrong. So we wind up with a cold. The cough is a symptom of the cold. It's not the cold itself. Is that right? The runny nose is not the cause, it's a symptom of something else. You with me? What the Lord does is, is He sort of reverses the process and He says, if you got evil speaking going on, the evil speaking is a symptom of a deeper problem. And the deeper problem is, is you grieve the Holy Spirit, so there's no restraint and now you're turned completely over to the flesh. And guess what happened? Right back where we were in 2 Timothy, the devil just took you captive. And you didn't smoke. And you didn't drink. And you didn't carouse around and watch stuff you shouldn't or whatever the list is. You weren't dressing wrong. You were still going to church. You're still reading your Bible. You're still praying. But you know what you did? Literally, when the speed bump came up and said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, you said, I will. And the Holy Spirit said, not my will. Do you see? So you can all do an inward look this morning. One of the great things about what's happened is, is you should have, most likely, most of you have had some time I realize it's frustrating to be jammed up and can't go anywhere and all that other kind of stuff, but you should have had some time to be introspective. A lady told me the other day, she said, Preacher, you know, one of the great things about this is I'm, I'm cleaning out closets and I'm cleaning out drawers and I'm, I'm cleaning out all these things and I, I should have done it a long time ago and this and that and the other. And the thought crossed my mind for me. I got some closets I should have cleaned out a long time ago and they're not where my clothes hang. And they're not where my tools are stored. And they're not where I got stuff in there for the millennial. It's closets inside. I just have stuff stored in there. You know what I mean? It's just, I just have it stored in there. I, I, I mean, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's stored, it's collecting dust, but it'd be good for me to go in and clean that closet out. Let the light in. Isn't it amazing, some of the closets, at least for me, my, my wife's clean as a pen, she keeps everything clean. It's amazing to me how when I'm going in certain things, the rooms relatively was shut off, or at least the closet was, and there's dust in it. How, it's deteriorating. And then I look inside and the Lord's like, been a while since you've been in here, huh, boy? Lord, you know what? I think I'll save that for the next epidemic. I think I'll, I'll, let's clean out an easier one. The Lord's like, well, we're already in here. Why don't we deal with this? Well, Lord, there's a lot of stuff in here. I, 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 well... You know, Lord, there's a lot of stuff in here that I probably should get rid of, but I want to keep it. And the Lord's like, why? You a hoarder? You holding on to something there? You got a root of bitterness there? Well, you get the picture, right?